hard to imagine anyone today who's familiar with the Bible not being concerned about the violence in the Old Testament. It's a fashionable bomb tossed by the new atheists, and it's the easiest way for critics of Christianity to just dismiss the Bible. To hear them talk on every page of the Old Testament, cities are burned to the ground, whole populations annihilated, and Yahweh, the God of Israel, is portrayed as a wrathful tribal deity constantly calling his people to commit atrocities in his name. Well, the problem with violence in the Old Testament actually centers mainly around the stories of Israel's struggle to settle the land of Canaan, stories that are told in the books of Joshua and Judges. So let's begin by looking in a general way at the question of violence in the Old Testament, and then, in installments to follow, we'll turn specifically to Joshua and Judges. In all of this, central to getting the Bible right is hearing it in its own cultural and historical setting. This is not just good scholarship, it's good listening. And that's why I'm excited to be sharing this with you while standing at a little known and less visited site that's possibly one of the earliest places where the Israelites assembled and worshiped as they settled the land of Canaan. Being a stranger in this barren, desolate place reminds me that the biblical characters did not live in a world of civilian police, ambulance service, and 911. And they didn't have 2,000 years of reflection on the whole Bible. The Old Testament characters need to be seen and heard in their own time. Now, with that in mind, I just want to give you seven facts to help focus the question of violence in the Old Testament. Fact number one. Jesus and the New Testament writers never complain about the violence in the Old Testament. Now that should flash at least a yellow caution light on our hasty dismissal of the Old Testament. Are we more morally sensitive than Jesus and the New Testament writers? Or did they see something in the Old Testament that perhaps we miss? Fact number two, historians tell us that the land of Canaan at the time of the Israelite settlement was not inhabited by a uniform indigenous population. Canaan was a crossroads in a diverse culture of many different groups. You know, all the ites, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, you almost expect stalactites, stalactites, and termites. Now, if you'd ask a random inhabitant of Canaan, whose land is this? You'd have gotten a lot of different answers. It was a no man's land. Fact number three, Genesis 12 to 50 tells us that the Israelites' ancestors had actually lived in Canaan for centuries before their time in Egypt. They were not outsiders trying to take a land from its original owners. In fact, the pharaohs of Egypt would have seen no real difference between Canaanites and Israelites. They came from the same place, spoke the same language, they all looked alike. So there was no parallel, really, between the book of Joshua and, say, the European settlers in North America displacing the earlier inhabitants. Fact number four, and this is a biggie. By Joshua's day, Canaan had long suffered under a harsh political system. Canaan in the time of Moses and Joshua had been ruled for centuries by Egypt. Pharaoh considered himself to be God incarnate and appointed rulers in the top 30 or so towns of Canaan. They managed the country like a giant agricultural plantation, a kind of factory farm. They focused on producing a small number of crops valued by the Egyptian upper classes. Now this had serious consequences. First of all, this focus on massive production of a few crops not only risked depleting the land, it destroyed the local self-sustaining economies of small villages and towns. These little communities needed a diverse mix of farming and herding just to survive. The Egyptians, who also yanked the best of the workforce out of these towns and villages as forced labor, and so they emptied the land of Canaan of its best workers. Many people from Canaan, not just the future Israelites, ended up as slaves in Egypt. Generally, settlement patterns in Canaan about 1300 BC, just before the Exodus and Conquest, show that the hill country was largely emptied out. Under this kind of regime, Canaan was unstable and violent. City rulers fought each other, hired mercenaries, sometimes cruelly treated the local populace. Bandits terrorized the highways, and men stripped of their land and living gathered around warlords, some of whom were good men, others just thugs and gangsters. So, by the time Joshua led the Israelites into Canaan, the place was dark and bloody ground. It's just possible that far from being seen as invaders, Joshua and the Israelites might have represented the arrival of order, justice, and maybe even peace. Fact number five. The Old Testament shows us that even in the conquest stories, the Israelites were not really a militarized nation. Other nations boasted of their weapons and crack troops, but the Israelites were not a professional army. 
And likewise, the Israelites were not a huge group. The idea found in some textbooks that there were two and a half million Israelites comes from a misunderstanding of the Hebrew terminology for numbers. Archaeologists tell us that there probably weren't two and a half million people living in all of Canaan and Syria combined. Then the books of Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges stress that the Israelites were outnumbered, outmaneuvered, and outgunned. After Joshua, they had no central authority. They were only a coalition of tribes, and they were often divided, often untrue to their own religion. The Bible says they needed miraculous divine intervention just to survive. Hardly the profile of a nation of bloodthirsty imperialists. Fact number six, warlike nations and all of Israel's ancient neighbors gloried in their superior weapons and firepower. Images of Pharaoh portray him holding his hapless enemies by the hair and smiting them with a mace or a battle axe. Or Pharaoh thunders along in his war chariot, the horse's reins tied around his waist, unleashing arrows against his cringing foes. The Old Testament stresses that the Israelites were poorly armed, confronting fortified cities or huge chariot forces on foot. The Old Testament also emphasizes Israel's lack of metal workers. Again, not exactly a warrior nation. Fact seven, and finally, the world of Moses, Joshua, Gideon, and David was a world of unutterable violence, perpetrated by massive, well-armed professional armies. The kings of Egypt and Asia Minor and Mesopotamia gloried in their brutality and savagery. They boasted of boring through their enemies' bodies, ripping their entrails out, galloping their horses and chariots through the gore of enemy bodies, splashing through enemy blood as though crossing a river, and even castrating the dead. Now, you know, almost nobody in the ancient Near East even found this shocking. Most thought it was glorious proof that the gods had favored the king. So compared to the graphic detail, intensity, and the sheer mass of these ancient descriptions, the Old Testament looks rather tame, even modest. Whatever problems we might have with violence in the Old Testament, it was one who claimed to be the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament, Jesus, whose Hebrew name was Joshua, who appealed constantly to the Old Testament witness. Schooled in the Old Testament, Jesus called his people to love their enemies and be peacemakers, not uh, be inspired by the Old Testament, uh, and not uh, in spite of the Old Testament heritage, but because of it. And that's something to think about.